and splint, splintered, so it affects the, the, the ventilation of the child. So the immediate uh, uh, treatment for that is in, in, insertion of a nasogastric tube, and we leave them for 24 hours. You can see on the picture it's a massively distended stomach, really interfering with the ventilation of the child. We also give all children a urinary catheter, uh, because uh, we know that the kidney is the only organ in which we can actually measure a perfusion by measuring urine output, and we would like to see an urine output of at least one milliliter per kilogram per hour. Other investigations, we do a blood test, uh, hemoglobin, uh, uh, urea and electrolytes, amylase, and x-rays. So the traditional x-ray series is a, a chest x-ray, AP, lateral C-spine and pelvis. At the Red Cross Children's Hospital, we are very privileged. We've got this machine, which is got, uh, called a low-dose x-ray scanner, LODOX, and we do a complete body scan within 10 seconds after the patient comes in, and we can magnify the areas of concern. Uh, other investigations are, of course, the CT of the abdomen. Uh, we uh, tend to do double contrast, and we think that's the best. And uh, there's also uh, the ultrasound, which can be used, but there's very little. Reports, actually no reports in the literature on you uh, report on that soon. Uh, peritoneal lavage is uh, really of historical uh, importance only. And laparoscopy is a really new technique which helps us diagnostically but also curative. The operative management, uh, the indication for immediate laparotomy is only two. The one is patients who present with hemodynamic instability, and the second one if they've got an associated intraabdominal injury which requires surgery. So the decision is based on clinical findings only and not on radiological findings. That is a very important message. So if we do a CT, what are we looking for? We are looking for a hollow viscous rupture uh, in a stable patients with an acute abdomen. And we, in these cases, we do an emergency CT. So if the patient presents at night, we do air. If there's free air, we do an immediate laparotomy. If we are concerned about the possibility of a solid organ injury we, and the patient is hemodynamically stable, we keep the patient, uh, uh, we admit the patient and we do the CT scan in office hours. Of course, there's a risk of uh, CT, which is depending on the age and the dose, uh, but especially in children under the age of one year, they're very vulnerable. And of course, abdominal and chest CT is worse than CT of the head. There is a lifetime calculated risk for malignancy of 0.1% of a CT head in a one-year-old. So we, we uh, stick to the ALARA principle, so we radiate the children uh, as low as reasonably acceptable. If we look at uh, patient trauma in our center, we reviewed recently uh, 307 cases. Uh, 135 of them had an isolated liver injury and 172 had an associated injury. So the majority of patients with ruptured liver have also other organs injured. The majority of organs were head, head injuries, uh, other intra-abdominal uh, organs, fractures, and chest injuries. If you look at which other intra-abdominal injuries uh, uh, organs were injured, it was the spleen in the majority of cases, then uh, renal, uh, followed by pancreas and bowel. Uh, what is interesting is that we treated the vast majority from the 307, we treated 288 not operative. Only 16 were operated and three died so soon after arrival that we never had time to take them to theater. Just a couple of uh, CT scans. You can see uh, on the left top uh, diffuse uh, ruptures of the liver with uh, the black area between the chest wall and the liver indicating uh, blood. Uh, on the right side, uh, we can see uh, uh, another big rupture in segment uh, uh, 6 and 7 of the liver. Uh, here you can see a, a ruptured liver with an associated uh, uh, spleen rupture uh, injury of the liver. Uh, Non-operative uh, uh, management was not without complications. Two patients.
just uh, developed a subcapsular hematoma. One was taken for delayed laparotomy, and one was operated uh, non-operatively. Seven children uh, developed abscesses, three in the liver, one in the pelvis, two sopranic, and one in the abdominal wall. One patient developed a pancreatic pseudocyst, one had a fat embolism, and one had an adhesive bowel obstruction. The operative uh, management uh, also had complications. 16 patients were operated for immediate laparotomy, 13 survived, and three died. Uh, two died from multiple organ failure, and one child uh, died from an associated severe head injury. The complications, 11 early complications, uh, abscesses, bile leaks, pancreatic fistula, and hematemesis, and one late complication, and it is of bowel obstruction again. Now, the operative management can be divided into two and complicated techniques. Simple techniques are cautery, topical hemostatic agents, ligation of the vessels, complicated uh, mental wrapping or packing, mesh wrapping, hepatic artery ligation, and atrial cable shunting. Uh, from our center, what we can say is that if a uh, liver injury is packed, do not put the packs in the tear. If you put the packs in the tear, which you can see here on the graft, you go to the hilum of the liver where the vessels are bigger, especially the hepatic veins are very fragile and very large diameter. And you cause more bleeding and trouble. The technique of packing is aimed at restoring the normal anatomy. And the packs are outside the liver, on top and below. That is a very important uh, issue. Um, the follow-up, uh, the, the imaging we use in follow-up are uh, serial ultrasounds and uh, serial CT scan. All the patients we followed up uh, showed resolution and healing of the hepatic injury uh, after three to nine months, depending on the severity of the injury. So conclusions of this talk, the conclusions of abdominal trauma in children. 95% or more can be managed without operation. What is important is that not operative operation does not mean conservative. Actually, if you do not operate a child, it may be more intensive for you because you worry about this child all the time. You have to go and check the, the child all the time. So it's an, a high or intensive care management of the child. It's not operative, but you have to keep a very close eye. The challenge is early recognition of severe injuries and, and, and a recognition of, of a failure of conservative management. Surgery can be ideally only should be taking place at the specialist center. If you just put packs, wrap packs around the liver, restoring the normal anatomy, and refer. The prognosis is very good. The overall complication rate is 8%, and the mortality in our series is only 1%. So the new concepts we discussed, diaphragmatic rupture in children is along the chest wall and not the dome, is in adults use as little uh, radiation as possible. Uh, if possible, do a total body imaging. Uh, restore the normal anatomy if you have to pack the liver. And uh, in small bowel, look either for small pressure uh, necrosis on the small bowel or large ruptures of the big solid, the big hollow viscous injuries, minimum invasive surgery. And I thank you for your attention, and hereby I give you the bibliography. Hello. Dr. Van Oss, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. We, that was spectacular. Oh, uh, you're great. You got us right back on track. And we're going to probably have questions. Obviously, because of our audio issues, we're running really behind. But we're yes. going to get hopefully be able to have time for questions. And let me tell everyone in the audience, Please go ahead and chat your questions, and uh, we can uh, have uh, doctor questions by chat. Would that be okay, Dr. Van Oss? Yes. Perfect. And then hopefully we'll come back in time for the panel. Uh, Dr. Cannon, are you there? Perfect. Uh, thank you for, for sitting tight and waiting uh, for this to be fixed. I appreciate your patience. Uh, Dr. Cannon is the uh, Trauma Acute Care Surgery uh, Program Director of the a Fellowship in uh, the San Antonio Medical Center. Uh, and he is going to be uh, talking to us today on vascular injury. Dr. Cannon. Very good. Thank you. It's a real privilege to be online with so many friends and colleagues and uh, some new acquaintances.
I'll uh, try to breeze through a really important topic, uh, building on some of the concepts that were introduced in the previous section and focused uh, principally on vascular injury here. So the type of uh, injuries that we're going to be talking about are uh, range from this patient uh, that might be in your medical center, I weighed a um, uh, cold uh, lower extremity after an invasive procedure, or if you're in a, in a austere environment or in a combat setting, a patient that's identified during a mass casualty like this one uh, that has much more uh, competing interest than you identify uh, what appears to be uh, a pretty definitive time of a vascular injury. So the um, overview of my talk, I'll talk about uh, some of the demographics of the epic vascular couple form and this is going to be suspect of vascular injury. Some of the imaging uh, adjuncts that might be useful in a patient for the diagnosis is not entirely clear. I'll uh, spend a minute about my uh, operative management principles and uh, some of the left side going for a deployed environment uh, and uh, some of the outcome spec. I'll also spend just a brief direction that hopefully this um, uh, web seminar can. Uh, so just by way of uh, uh, demographics, vascular injury in pediatric trauma patients is relatively uncommon. Most centers that report their experience cite about a 1% incidence uh, among their uh, population. We did a recent review of the Joint Theater Trauma Registry and found that our incidence was a little bit higher at 3.5%. Um, you'll have a range of uh, different uh, um, mechanisms, as I've shown here, uh, what I call traumatic, which is uh, a primary trauma, as well as iatrogenic. And the overall pediatric population of the split is about 50-50. Today we'll be focusing mostly on these uh, traumatic injuries uh, where the patient comes in with some sort of either blunt or penetrating mechanism. If you look at the, the civilian experience versus the combat experience, uh, the uh, split between blunt and penetrating is very interesting center pediatric uh, environment for patients that come in trauma uh, in a civilian setting, uh, many of those injuries will actually be penetrating, uh, about 70%, and about 30% will be uh, blunt injuries. This uh, ratio is even um, more uh, heavily in favor of that environment where up to 96% of uh, vascular injuries are actually penetrating. So it's very important that we review some of the management principles uh, in a forum like this. By way of initial evaluation, um, uh, when you have a patient with multiple injuries uh, and some of those injuries involve the extremity, you want to look first for uh, hard signs of vascular injury. You want to ask your pre-hospital personnel if they apply tourniquets and also do an assessment uh, during a mass casualty to get a good a sign out or, or report from your pre-hospital folks. And so you want to look at all the extremities for any evidence of tourniquets. And I actually use this as a, a sign of a vascular injury and tend not to take those down in the If the patient does not have tourniquets and has no hard signs of a vascular injury, uh, you can then turn to a, a Doppler assessment if they have no, no palpable pulses. And uh, that's just a handheld Doppler looking for um, an audible signal. If the patient does have an audible signal but has uh, injuries in them that uh, have experience with uh, vascular uh, surgery, uh, this is very similar to an ankle break heel index where you're simply comparing the uh, system pressure of the injured extremity to a non-injured extremity initial resuscitation and evaluation, you'll want to implement some of the damage control principles that were mentioned in the previous section. Uh, specifically, you want to resuscitate, focusing and using principally uh, blood products, trying to uh, replace the lost uh, uh, blood volume. You want to try to rewarm the patient and even avoid hypothermia and reassess the extremity uh, uh, after those uh, resuscitation measures have been implemented. Now for neck and torso trauma, also assessed for vascular injury, you're looking for hard signs, specifically expanding hematomas or uh, in the torso if they have penetrating abdominal trauma, hypotension and tachycardia, uh, there's a likelihood that they have an intra-abdominal vascular injury of some sort. Uh, 
What are your imaging options? So in uh, the year 2012, there's a lot of discussion about CT angiogram. Uh, I generally use that to assess for occult injuries, focusing mostly on uh, those injuries that involve the head and neck and torso in generally a stable patient. Of course, you do not want to take an unstable a patient to the CT scanner, that's a setup for problems. And where, uh, for example, they might have fragmentation injuries, a CT angio is actually a very important uh, imaging uh, modality. I've shown here a conventional angiogram that we performed in a, uh, one of our trauma patients uh, where they had some evidence of vasospasm, you can see down here. Uh, I use that uh, selectively. I use that in uh, uh, patients where they have uh, no hard signs of vascular injury, but they have soft signs. So, uh, for example, a proximity injury um, or uh, a injured extremity index that is uh, abnormal. I'll use an angiogram to try to localize the injury. Also, as far as operative principles, the indication for exploration of the five times of mass injury, standing in the coma, drill, or blue, or as I mentioned earlier, present for the medicine. And then and you can also have uh, half times of mass injury that identify vascular injury uh, on CT angiogram or conventional angiogram you want to be then in the operating room. My operative uh, approach includes the following. You first want to isolate, identify, uh, open the wound and debride the, uh, the devitalized surrounding soft tissue. Uh, once you've gained vascular control, you actually also want to debride the vessel. Um, as far as placing shunts, uh, the most important uh, point here is to identify which patients you want to shunt. Uh, and I selective shunting, um, and I principally target those patients that have uh, physiologic uh, derangements. physiologic derangements, uh, as well as patients that have combined orthopedic and vascular injuries. So the approach here is to uh, place a shunt, which can be anything from uh, an argyle uh, carotid artery shunt uh, to an angiocath that you've cut and then placed a tie around. Um, you place those shunts uh, into the um, injured uh, uh, vessel, and then um, you secure them with ties on either end. Um, as far as uh, uh, anticoagulation, I only use regional um, anticoagulation. By that, I mean I inject heparinized saline, 100 units per ml, uh, both proximally and distally. Um, it's also very important to remove any distal thrombus. Uh, so a, a one or two Fogarty embolectomy catheter I will uh, actually um, make it down into a pediatric uh, extremity vessel and can be used to remove any clot. As far as the repair technique, a couple points are very important. Um, our uh, principal approach is to use a reverse saphenous vein, and typically we will harvest that from the contralateral uh, lower extremity. Um, we use interrupted proline sutures. It's also very important to spatulate your anastomosis so that uh, there's no area of uh, uh, seriously consider performing a lower extremity fasciotomy. This is generally below the knee. It should be done through uh, not, as others have said, uh, sparing any uh, length. You want to go big or go home on these fasciotomy incisions. So uh, a medial and lateral incision, and you want to open all four compartments. What we've seen in theater is that uh, the compartment that's most often missed is the anterior compartment. So it's very important that you ensure once you make your long uh, skin incisions that you get down to the fascia, identify all four compartments and make sure you open those widely. Is there a role for endovascular repair? I would say the role is very limited. Um, generally, we have used endovascular techniques uh, in junctional uh, hemorrhage. So for example, uh, an iliac injury as it's uh, passing down through the inguinal ligament or a um, subclavian to axillary injury. There have been a couple situations where in a damage control setting, a covered uh, stent graft has actually gotten us out of hot water. As far as outcomes, um, in our review of the Joint Theater Trauma Registry, we found that our limb salvage rate for uh, vascular trauma was 90%. And if you look here in the upper right, uh, this is a young man that had a vascular injury to the 
and had a successful reconstruction. He also had a combined orthopedic injury, and that was able to be stabilized. The lower picture is a young girl where, unfortunately, we were not able to salvage her limb. She had an upper extremity crush injury, and despite aggressive efforts to save her extremity, was unfortunately were not successful. But our success rate uh, over the last uh, nine years that we reviewed was 90%. The middle picture is a young man that uh, had multiple fragmentation injuries. We actually used CT angiogram to um, uh, assist with the diagnosis. He had no, sign, no hard signs of vascular injury, but on CT angiogram, he had a, what appeared to be a small pseudoaneurysm of his carotid bifurcation. So we took him to the operating room uh, and through a standard uh, sternal clotomastoid uh, type incision for carotid exposure, we found that he had essentially a blowout of his uh, carotid bifurcation, and that was able to be repaired with um, an interposition graft. Without intervention, uh, and I think the theme of today is, uh, especially in penetrating trauma, being aggressive is very important. Without intervention, the outcomes that you can expect include leg length discrepancy if the patient does, in fact, have a vascular injury, and, and uh, unfortunately, in some cases, amputation. With intervention, uh, there are some challenges associated with vasospasm, uh, but uh, those can be surmounted with use of things like uh, adjuncts like papaverin, injected directly into the vessel. Uh, the limb salvage rate in Afghanistan is very high at, as I mentioned, 90 percent. Our patency rate is based uh, principally on uh, short-term in-hospital uh, follow-up, uh, but that also has been very good. And uh, long-term functionality in our civilian population uh, seems to be improved with operative intervention. And we're still working on getting some longer-term follow-up uh, for our um, combat casualties and injured children in theater. Here's a vascular management pathway. I've really covered many of these principles, so I'll sort of uh, uh, skip uh, beyond that and leave that for you to review uh, offline future directions, we really need uh, evidence. And so I hope uh, forums like this will stimulate interest in uh, researching the best approaches to managing vascular injuries in children. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about vasospasm in children. So it would be very helpful, I think, first and foremost, to know what the vascular biology is of these vessels and what leads to the vasospasm and then how we can avoid it. And we also need uh, better data on long-term outcomes. And that leads me to the final point, and that is we need to collaborate. I believe I believe, uh, as we've seen in theater, establishing a vascular registry, both the demographics as well as uh, the different uh, uh, management techniques that are either successful or not successful. And I think that uh, principle should, can and should be applied to the civilian setting where we have, uh, for example, a national vascular injury registry for children. And finally, I think we need to continue training uh, our general surgeons, trauma surgeons, pediatric surgeons on how to deal with this injury that comes up rather infrequently. And with that, I really thank you for this opportunity, and I'll look forward to being on the panel. For you both. Fantastic, uh, Dr. Cannon. That was a great review. We actually have uh, <clears throat> questions for you, but we're going to wait to the panel if we can. And if we don't get a chance to make it as we try to make up time, would you mind answering some of those questions through the chat? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you so much. We're going to move on now to the next talk. This is, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Nance, who is the Templeton Professor of Surgery and the Director of Pediatric Trauma at CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Nance, are you there? I am here. Welcome, and I apologize for the delay. Uh, we want to welcome you and thank you for your patience. So uh, you're going to talk to us today on the spine and evaluation and clearance. So uh, thank you for your talk. Well, very good. I appreciate the uh, wonderful opportunity and, and uh, offer greetings from uh, Philadelphia. And in my 15 minutes or so, I'll, I'll try to actually make up a little time if I can. I'm going to talk about the evaluation and, and clearance of the uh, pediatric cervical spine. Um, the objectives of the talk will be to discuss the significance of the problem, give a little a brief uh, epidemiologic picture, um, talk about some of the evidence that does exist for assessment of the pediatric cervical spine, and then and, uh, the approaches we use to uh, clear the, the pediatric C-spine. Uh, essentially, the, the why, who, when, and, and how of uh, pediatric uh, cervical spine injury. Um, 
if you look at uh, all trauma victims, about 10% of cervical spine injuries occur in the pediatric population. And in uh, children, about 60 to 80% of those uh, injuries occur in the cervical uh, region. Um, and about 1 to 2% of all pediatric trauma admissions uh, uh, a spine injury. Um, and uh, what's concerning is that there's a very high associated mortality, somewhere in the 20 to 25 percent range. Uh, that is typically uh, from the associated head injury. Um, and there's also a great potential for morbidity associated with a, a cervical spine injury. Uh, three studies highlight the prevalence. I'll uh, go through these uh, quite quickly to save a little bit of time. Uh, they, they really uh, take advantage of large databases, the National Pediatric uh, trauma registry. Uh, there were two studies that, that demonstrate a prevalence of about 1.6 percent or 1.5 percent of all um, trauma admissions, uh, and then a uh, large study from the National uh, Trauma Data Bank, uh, which had 1,500 cervical spine in kids, so age less than three uh, uh, kids had uh, C-spine injuries of all Missions and about 0.4 percent had an actual cord injury recorded uh, skiwara or spinal cord injury without radiologic abnormality. Uh, this demonstrates, uh, if it uh, pulls up, I guess it's a little bit of a different image on my screen than than the original slide. But the so rather the injuries are are distributed in the young kids. Um, mainly to the upper uh, spine, so about 40 percent occur in the C1, C2 region. Um, if you look at the uh, older kids, uh, they're distributed a little bit more evenly, so about 50 percent occur in the upper C spine uh, and about 50 percent uh, in the lower C spine. Um, who needs cervical spine clearance? Uh, this is a, a bit of a a rhetorical question, uh, it's, it's all trauma patients need. be quite trivial, a, a kid with a uh, ankle sprain or, or ulnar fracture, and there might be very low risk, um, uh, but it also may be uh, a patient in a motor vehicle collision. So all trauma patients need some sort of a spinal assessment and clearance. And when should the cervical spine be cleared? Uh, this too is a, a bit of a rhetorical question. It, it should be cleared uh, as soon as is uh, clinically feasible, and that may be uh, at the acute setting in the trauma bay, but it also may not be for a day or two or longer, uh, depending on the associated injuries and, and what else is going on uh, uh, clinically. So I think what most people are probably interested in is, is how we actually uh, clear the pediatric C-spine, and, and what I'll do is, is talk about a couple studies which are, are giving us some initial insight into risk factors and, and how to potentially go about uh, clearing the cervical spine. Uh, and this is uh, the Nexus study. It's one of the most commonly referenced uh, studies in the group. Um, but in addition to the adults, they also included a pediatric cohort. Uh, and again, this is the National Emergency X-ray Utilization Study. And they looked at uh, low-risk criteria, uh, and those include patients with the absence of midline cervical tenderness, intoxication, and altered mental status focal neurologic deficit or some other distracting injury. And in the pediatric uh, cohort, they stratified by age into a preverbal group, an immature spine group, uh, and uh, older children, 9 to 17 years of age. And the, the main study had 34,000 patients, and included in that uh, group was uh, 3,000 uh, children. And overall, they had 30 spinal injuries uh, identified, or, or just under 1%. Uh, and this represented 3.7% uh, of the uh, entire spinal uh, column injured patient group. And if they applied those low-risk low criteria, about 20% of their population um, had no, uh, no abnormalities uh, and could be put into the low-risk group. They noted no uh, low-risk patients had an injury, so they reported a 100% sensitivity and a 100% caveat is that there were very few infants or toddlers, so you need to use caution when applying this, um, applying the nexus rules uh, to that group. Um, they also, uh, in their study, had 
no cases of Skiwara or the spinal cord injury without radiological sort of most um, uh, studies. They also noted the low risk uh, patients were more likely to be younger, 0 to 8, uh, than the older group, 9 to 18, and that's probably, that's probably a reflection of uh, um, the mechanisms that, that are involved. Um, again, there are very few instances of toddlers, about 6% in the uh, and since there were only 30 um, um, patients identified in the interview, that's about that's two or three, three toddlers, so, so really very difficult, difficult to, to make any assessment on, on toddlers. toddlers. And one of the other concerns uh, is that uh, in follow-up studies, studies that are unable to achieve uh, the same sensitivity as the original medical study studies, it's something worth watch watching. I'll skip the slide as the data is repeated in this, uh, this next slide. Uh, and to try to answer some of the concerns uh, from the next study, uh, on the younger age kids, it's uh, the project from Pete Mafiakos and their group in Boston. And they uh, accumulated data from 22 pediatric trauma centers across the globe uh, and had 12,000 children. less than equal to three, three years, years and the spine injury is 0.7% overall. overall. Uh, they uh, identified they independent, independent uh, predictors of risk, uh, uh, which were a GCS of less than or equal to 14, uh, kids uh, involved in a motor vehicle collision, collision. Uh, uh, an I an score on the CS evaluation of one, or an age of greater than two. Uh, so the older kids in this very narrow uh, age range of patients. Statistical analysis, they were able to create a weighted score. Uh, and those patients with the GCS that was not normal and are equal to 14 would get a weighted score of three. Uh, those with a motor vehicle collision got a weighted score of 2. If the I score was uh, a 1, then they would get a weighted score of 2. Uh, this is uh, the category for some patients uh, would need no special imaging. imaging. Uh, if the weighted score was two or greater, then uh, they recommended using uh, clinical um, that, that doesn't mean that they need a special imaging such as CT scan. That means uh, you need to evaluate that individually and decide if uh, additional imaging is necessary. Uh, and the, the final uh, data-driven study that I was going to uh, go over is that uh, put out by the PCAR network, the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, group across the U.S. Uh, that created a multi multi-center study and they looked at cervical spine injury after one trauma. Uh, and it's a data-driven model. And uh, uh, they, they had 540, 540 cases, cases, which they which compared to 1,000 controls, controls and developed an eight-risk track. Hello, Dr. Nance? Yes. yes. This is Steve. Can I ask you just to pause your presentation for a minute? Okay. okay. And uh, we're having another audio issue. Yeah. I'm going to shut our audio bridge down and reconnect. It'll take just uh, a couple seconds here. Okay. If uh, any of the panelists get cut off from our audio bridge, please call back in. Okay. Be about one minute.
Welcome to the Meeting One Conferencing Service. You are joining the meeting. Check one, two. Check one, two, one moment. Check one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. Um, I that was given interference. Um, definitely given interference. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, the Pediatric Trauma Web Symposium. Uh, Professor Nance, uh, we will um, back up a couple slides here, and then I'll uh, unmute your phone so that you can continue your talk. So you want to back up to where you uh, – a couple slides, and then I'll unmute your phone and we'll continue. Okay. One moment. Are we live? Yes, you can proceed. All right. It'll Thank take, you. Uh, It'll take a few days for my ears to recover after that one. But um, so I backed up uh, a little bit, and I'll I'll talk about how we clear the pediatric uh, C-spine. And uh, the first the first study to help do this is the Nexus study, and this is uh, often quoted in the adult literature, um, the National Emergency X-ray Utilization Study. But included in that uh, primarily adult study uh, were a group of kids. Um, and in this study, they identified uh, several low-risk criteria uh, for evaluating the patient that put them at low risk for having an associated cervical spine injury. And these included the absence of uh, the following, midline cervical tenderness, intoxication, altered mental status, focal deficit, or distracting injury. Uh, they stratified the pediatric uh, cohort into preverbal, immature spine, uh, and the older child. And uh, in the Nexus study, they had 35,000 patients uh, overall, including about 3,000 children. They identified 30 spinal injuries, or about 1% of the population of children. Uh, and this represented about 3.7% of the overall spinal cord injured population. And if they applied their uh, variables, uh, about 20% of the patients were considered low risk. And in that population, they were found to have an injury. Their study had a 100% sensitivity uh, and a 100% negative predictive value. Uh, one of the caveats, however, was that there were very few uh, infants or toddlers, uh, so you should use caution when trying to apply the nexus rules uh, in the pediatric patient. Um, some additional, uh, the next study, they had no cases of sclerosis or the spinal cord injury without radiologic abnormality. Uh, and this uh, may simply reflect that it's, a, uh, you know, an, an era of uh, MRI, and that may be the, the main reason. Um, the low risk population, or, or low risk was uh, more likely in the younger kids, 0 to 8, uh, 25, 26% uh, than in the older kids, 
uh, where it was 18%, and that's probably um, uh, driven by the mechanisms of injury, which are a little bit more, uh, a little greater energy in the older kids. And again, few uh, infants or toddlers, about 6% uh, overall. And, and since they only had 30 patients with an identified spinal injury, that is uh, at uh, toddlers at most, so really use caution. And another thing which we'll need to keep our eye on is that a uh, few of the follow-up studies have been able to achieve the same sensitivity as the original Nexus study, so it's not quite clear why that is. Uh, but it does uh, start, provide, start to provide us with some uh, useful information. I'm going to skip this as it's in the next slide. Um, to try to address the uh, issue with uh, information about the youngest kids, uh, this is a study by Masiakos uh, and colleagues in Boston. Uh, and he gathered data from 22 pediatric trauma centers across the globe. Uh, there were a total of 12,000 children uh, in the uh, young age group, less than or equal to three years. Uh, and it included eight spine injuries, or about 0.67% of the overall population. In the study, they identified several independent predictors of risk, which included a GCS of less than or equal to 14. So that is uh, not uh, an entirely normal GCS was a risk factor. Uh, those kids involved in a motor vehicle collision, those that had an I component on their GCS score of one, uh, and those that were greater than two years of age, so the, the older end of this very narrow uh, age group. And applying statistical uh, methodology uh, came up with weighted scores. Uh, uh, for the different factors, so uh, you got a weighted score of three if you had an abnormal GCS, you got a weighted score of two if you were involved in a motor vehicle collision, and, and so on. And um, it reported that if the weighted score was zero or one, uh, no additional or no special imaging was necessary. And so almost 70% of the population fell into, uh, into this group. Um, if the weighted score was two or greater, uh, then it was recommended uh, use it to use clinical judgment. So. Uh, that doesn't mean that if you have two or greater, you need a CT scan or the like. It means that uh, that patient should be evaluated um, individually. So, you know, for instance, every child involved in a motor vehicle collision, you know, which would obviously have a weighted score of two, uh, it does not mean they all need uh, CT scans. It means you need to uh, evaluate them individually. Uh, and the, the final study I'll, I'll look at using some of these large uh, data-driven studies is this uh, one that came from the PCARN group, the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network. Uh, and this um, looked at uh, factors associated with cervical spine injury after blunt trauma. Um, and they uh, had 540 cases compared to 1,000 controls uh, and developed an eight risk factor model. And when that model was used, it had a sensitivity of 98%. Uh, and the uh, the risk factors uh, they found were altered mental status, focal neurologic deficit, complaint of neck pain, torticollis, uh, a significant uh, torso injury associated with the, with the C-spine or potential C-spine, any predisposing conditions uh, such as uh, Down syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos, which might put you at greater risk uh, for C-spine injury, and then high-risk mechanisms including diving uh, and motor vehicle uh, collisions. And again, the, the common uh, theme to these last three studies, which I talked about, they're all retrospective. Um, they uh, uh, have common, uh, identified some common risk factors like altered mental status and focal neurologic deficit, which obviously you can't. So it, it's starting to show uh, areas where you can, uh, you know, can't clear a C-spine, but uh, this is not really uh, addressing the, the question of when you can or how to clear it. Um, and so the next study uh, comes into play, and this is uh, just released uh, trauma. Uh, it's from the Trauma Association of Canada, and it's a consensus guideline uh, regarding um, uh, evaluation of the pediatric cervical spine. And I would say if you print one reference from the, the talk that I give, uh, this is probably it. Um, and it, the, uh, the trauma directors at the 15 pediatric centers in, in Canada uh, uh, got together. They decided, yes, we need to have uh, consensus guidelines. They then circulated the guidelines that already existed at their institutions, uh, created a draft um, uh, consensus guidelines, circulated it, revised it, and uh, this is essentially it. In addition, in the process, they did a very extensive literature review, uh, and they graded uh, the literature that was reviewed uh, using a methodology called GRADE. Uh, and if you want more information on the specifics, you can um, get that from uh, the paper itself. Um, but it, it uh, 
looked at the, the evidence which was available uh, and then categorized recommendations into strong, um, uh, meaning the evidence is pretty good uh, and enough to say that this is probably a, a, a meaningful recommendation. Uh, or the other would be it's weak or conditional, uh, meaning not, not enough uh, information or, or uh, they don't suggest doing it. And it's a balance of uh, desirable and undesirable effects reported, evidence presented, uh, and the cost of some of the uh, recommendations. And from the study, there were uh, seven uh, recommendations, uh, uh, including strong evidence for the fact that it's possible to, to clinically clear the pediatric C-spine, strong evidence that um, patients should be mani managed whenever possible using the lowest uh, uh, doses of radiation. Uh, weak or condemnation about the use of the odontoid view, uh, strong evidence for the fact that plain radiographs should still be the initial assessment tool, weak or conditional evidence about the utility of flexion extension radiographs, strong evidence for the use of MRI uh, to evaluate uh, a patient with abnormal neurologic examination, and weak or conditional evidence about uh, how to approach the unreliable clinical examination um, in pediatric patients. Um, I'll, I'll uh, deviate just for a, a single slide about the risk estimation. We already heard a little bit about it in one of the earlier talks. Um, the risk estimates about uh, radiation exposure from imaging um, are based on the risk estimates that, that came from mortality data from survivors uh, of atomic bomb blast in World War II. And there's very strong evidence to, of increased cancer mortality risk uh, for doses over 100 millisieverts uh, if the dose is 50 to 100 millisieverts. And there's reasonable evidence of increased cancer mortality risk uh, for doses in the 10 to 50 millisievert range. And to put that into perspective, um, uh, the mean exposure for a patient being evaluated at a pediatric trauma center is about 12 to 14 millisieverts. Uh, and that's primarily driven by um, the uh, CT scanning that's done. So. Um, Again, there's reasonable evidence of it that we're uh, putting the kids at increased mor uh, cancer mortality risk uh, since we're falling into that 10 to 50 millisievert range. Um, I'll skip these uh, two slides about uh, risk estimation and go back um, and talk about uh, the actual guidelines that uh, the Trauma Association of Canada uh, published. Uh, and this is sort of the uh, money slide. It's very busy, as you'll see in the end. Um, hopefully, this will uh, uh, pop up correctly. Um, but I'll try to walk you through it. Uh, so it starts with if you're able to clear the, the C-spine clinically, uh, you should uh, clear it and remove the collar. Uh, if you can't, uh, uh, films, and that would include in the cooperative patient three views, um, uh, or in the uncooperative patient probably just the two views, and then add the neurologic assessment. If that uh, assessment is abnormal, then uh, you should uh, leave the collar on, get an MRI, um, plus minus a CT. Again, that's institutional uh, based. Um, and then whoever is going to be involved with managing your spines, uh, they should be consulted. Uh, if it's the neurologic assessment is normal, uh, then you evaluate the adequacy of your x-rays. Uh, if they're normal and the patient's uh, above eight, then you can uh, simply re-examine uh, and see if they uh, can be cleared at that time. If uh, the patient is less than eight years of age um, uh, and you're not planning on a head CT re-examine group, if you are planning on a head CT, then they uh, recommended considering getting a C1, C3 um, uh, CT scan, so looking uh, at C1 through C3. And if that's normal, then they're going to go into the re-examine group. Uh, our bias at our institution is not to get this uh, CT. We would just put them straight into that re-examine group. Um, if the CT is abnormal, then uh, leave the collar on and get the, the uh, spine team involved. Um, if you go back up to this uh, re-examine group and, and they have an abnormal exam, specifically they have C-spine tenderness, then uh, you can consider flexion extension. Again, the evidence is uh, unclear or inconclusive, I should say. Um, uh, and at this point, you probably want to consider a, a uh, spine uh, service consult. And if the uh, films are normal uh, and adequate, then you can consider uh, discharging and with close follow-up. If your uh, flexion extension views, if you've chosen to get them, are abnormal, then you leave the collar on and you're going to move to an MRI for more definitive uh, 
evaluation. Uh, if you have, uh, you go back to re-examine the patient and they have an abnormal exam, then obviously you're going to leave the collar on. You're going to move to MRI and get the spine service involved. If you, when you uh, re-examine, uh, you can uh, clear them, then you can remove the collar and um, if uh, you go back at the top here and your films were not uh, adequate or not normal, uh, then you can consider a, a CT of the C-spine for further evaluation. If that's normal, you go drop back into the re-examine group. If it's abnormal, uh, you're in the collar on and spine service. So that's the uh, reliable clinical exam uh, pathway. It's, it's a little bit busy um, when you look at it overall, but actually as you walk through it, it's not, uh, it's not that bad. Uh, and it's, it's one of the better uh, uh, algorithms that I've uh, seen come along. And then uh, briefly, this is what you do for an exam. If their neurologic exam is abnormal, you leave the collar on, you get an MRI and get the spine normal, um, but you can't, rely, can't uh, clear it, then you're going to get x-rays. It can be an AP and lateral. You might consider a CT scan, and you're going to leave their collar on until you can examine them more reliably. If at that point they're abnormal, again, collar on, spine service consult. If they're normal, uh, then you continue to follow them until the level of consciousness uh, allows you to examine and, and clear clinically. If that doesn't occur, uh, leave the collar on and consider an MRI. If they do improve and they're alert and cooperative, then they fall back to that prior uh, slide I showed you uh, and the reliable clinical exam pathway. Uh, a couple local biases. Um, uh, we try to clear C-spines clinically whenever possible imaging. So if the patient's awake, alert, uh, and can follow exam, then, then you usually need nothing. Um, uh, we sometimes limit C-spine imaging uh, to a lateral view only if they're uh, otherwise unwell, a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on. You're not going to clear that C-spine to a lateral view just to make sure there's nothing catastrophic. Um, we have a very strong bias to leave the collar in place and examine. Uh, later, such as uh, you know, sometime out of the trauma bay where it's very active, or or frequently uh, even the next morning when the dust has settled, um, we use the MRI within 72 hours if we're unable to clear them uh, clinically. Um, and this is often uh, they're also getting ahead prognostic purposes uh, frequently um, as well. So uh, to sort of uh, spine clearance, that may be quite simple in in the majority of patients. Uh, uh, and a little more challenging in, in multi-system injuries. I only consider delayed clearance, uh, let the dust settle, and, and, and re-examine rather than uh, pursuing advanced imaging. We would recommend putting on a padded collar to avoid uh, skin breakdown, and for the same reason, we would try to get kids off of the spine board as quickly as possible. Um, you should uh, consider the limitations of your institution, both in uh, uh, manpower resources and equipment resources and develop guidelines uh, locally to existing resources. And uh, I would consider the using the um, Trauma Association of Canada guidelines. I think they're the best uh, uh, that I've seen um, put forth. And I think the challenge will be in the upcoming years to, to utilize those guidelines and then uh, study them prospectively. Uh, that is all I have uh, from a presentation standpoint. And I can, um, I can uh, stick around for question or chatting. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Nance, that was fantastic. And we have a lot of questions for you. And I would ask that you would uh, stay with us for, for the panel discussion that's coming up right now. Uh, we also have a couple of other. Um, Dr. Bulis, are you there? Dorothy Bulis? Uh, yes, while we're waiting. I'm great. How are you? Great. Uh, Dr. Bulitz is the, uh, well, you have a very long list of titles here. Just call her uh, professor. Just call her professor. I'm the token radiologist. <laughs> Dr. Bulitz is, uh, from my personal experience, one of the best radiologists I've ever worked with. Uh, she is at, Dr. Bulitz, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. I want to ask you quickly, and we're going to unfortunately shorten this panel, what thoughts you had on the last talk that, that you heard, and if you wanted to add anything, or any new ideas or new concepts? Yes, well, um, I think it was a fabulous, um, fabulous talk. I'm very impressed at how everyone has um, took on the whole image gently concept that if, if one thing I wanted to just make sure and reinforce was the fact that with the Hiroshima data that 
definitely we are concerned about radiation to children for many factors. And why we hallmark CT in particular is, is CT does have the highest um, radiation exposure. So again, if you think about um, a chest CT, one chest X-ray is equal to about 100, one chest CT is equal to about 100, 150 chest X-rays. And that's the same with the C-spine. So as you learn, it's a very high-risk injury for C-spine injuries, but such um, a low percentage of children actually have it. And it's not okay now to just say, well, we have this great CT ability, so let's just CT every child, uh, because the radiation risk is really a big issue. And on top of it, we're dealing with children who have squora, you know, have spinal cord injury without really radiologic um, abnormality. So your uh, subluxations are an issue that can actually be missed by CT I versus flexion extension if you don't have that availability should still be um, considered in your workup. But don't just use CT because it's convenient because it doesn't really answer many of the questions and now we do feel that there is probably some long-term issues. Dr. Buellis, are you there? Yes. Could you hear anything I said? I did until the last second. Um, okay. Yeah. Let me let me just say so. This is a topic that I felt strongly that I wanted to have in this show today because this is something that Dr. Eichelberger thinks is something that we talk about a lot, but I feel is still a, a very important topic that all of us, you know, not all agree on. And and, uh, and so I, I I think it's helpful for them to give their opinions on, on how they uh, use, utilize radiology different than what's been discussed here for, for C-spine clearance. So uh, thank you for your thoughts there. And also to remind everyone, a lot of the key points and current concepts and, and specifics of the lectures you're watching can all be found in the exhibit hall after the show or at the breaks. I want to um, introduce uh, another one of our panelists uh, is uh, Jean. Uh, Michel Zgiz in the phone line? Oh, yes. Uh, professor, yes. thank you for joining us. Uh, professor Giz is uh, calling in from uh, Mar Marseille, France. So thank you for joining us today. And I wanted to know if you Bonjour, could... Professor. Bonjour, mon ami. Oh. How are you doing? <laughs> thank you very much for calling in. Appreciate it. Did you have a question for Dr. Giz? Yeah, Dr. Giz, uh, uh, Dr. Van Oss uh, talked about uh, abdominal injury. Hey, can you tell them that the Ross is on the phone line? Yeah. So, sorry yeah. about that. Jean-Michel, Jean, Jean yeah. could you comment yeah. on the uh, urologic and uh, gen genital urinary uh, injuries and how the general comment? Well, um, the, the general comments will be to go really with uh, the sentence of uh, Sebastian because he, he, he stated that uh, uh, only the clinical findings 